I think I'll stay down here if that's okay um, with you. I will never tell any lawyer jokes again. <laughs> I didn't know that's how I got here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my story, how it is that I came to be doing what I'm doing, and um, then I'd like to spend a lot of time just talking, doing question and answer, because that's uh, the thing I enjoy. Um, and uh, my background is as a physician, and my specialty was emergency medicine. Um, I grew up in um, Maryland and in a dairy farming area. And the county that I grew up in had, uh, was the largest dairy producing county in the United States. That's what my area did, make milk. And um, <clears throat> uh, it had 70,000 people in it. It now has 1.1 million people in that county. And uh, so I've seen a lot of changes, and I'll tell you about some of those. Um, but anyways, I, I, I grew up on, uh, on the farm, as they say, and um, uh, grew up in a nominally Christian home. I went to, went to church, went to Sunday school, and um, it didn't quite take. And um, by the way, everything I say, take with a grain of salt, because when I was 22, I said that I would never go into a church again, except for a wedding or a funeral. And in the last 12 months, I'm told I've spoken in 110 churches. So take everything I say with a little bit of grain of salt. Um, <clears throat> anyways, I, um, I graduated third from the bottom of my high school class, and it was an industrial high school. Can anyone beat that record? Did you know that you can graduate with a 1.3 grade point average from high school? Well, it was the 70s and the late 60s. I won't go into that anymore. Um, but I became a carpenter, and uh, in a few years, I was found myself um, at a home of uh, some wealthy people, and I was doing remodeling work on it. I was putting a huge bay window in the house. It was about a 16-foot bay window, and these 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 folks were were well off, and and they were Jewish, and um, their daughter came home. Uh, from college, and I met her, and their worst nightmare began to unfold. <laughs> and we fell in love, and um, that's, that's who I'm married to, Nancy. And um, there, was, uh, there was not the greatest reaction when this Jewish girl married this nominally Christian guy. So we swore off religion. And um, <coughs> I went about uh, a change in life. She said, I think you probably would do well in school if you actually went and applied yourself. And, um, and so I, I, I started uh, in college. And fortunately, after two and a half years, I was accepted to medical school. I was highly motivated uh, at that time. And uh, went about pursuing the American dream. I had two children, eventually a son and a daughter, and uh, ended up being the chief of staff of a hospital and head of an ER on um, the coast in northern New England. And um, a few things um, happened in my life to really take me on a different path and a different journey. Um, one of the things actually happened in the hospital. The um, uh, I. I was working in the emergency department, in a week, and in a week's time, uh, three women came through the emergency department. All three were in their 30s. All three had breast cancer, and all three died. Um, and I wanted to know what were the odds of that, and I went and I looked it up. At that time, um, uh, one in nine women in the United States got breast cancer. When I looked at my textbook from when I started medicine it was one in 19. Today it's one in seven. How many of you have family or, or friend who's had breast cancer? Raise your hand. That's too many. How many of you have family or friend with asthma? That's too many. When I went to high school, I went that 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 dairy farming uh, area that I was talking about. 
there was 1,200 students in it, and I've checked, none has asthma. And today there are over 100 at that high school. There's more kids there, but there's a trend there. And I began to notice um, some changes uh, in, in medicine, but I've also noticed a lot of changes in, um, just in our environment in general. I don't work from statistics per se, but I do know that there's no elms on Elm Street anymore. There's no chestnuts on Chestnut Street. There's no caribou in Caribou, Maine. I could go on and on. The changes have actually been kind of profound in my lifetime, and I'm not exactly ancient. Well, my wife and I went on vacation with uh, my kids, and um, we went and we were staying on an island in the Gulf of Mexico off the um, west coast of Florida. And the kids went to bed early one night. <laughs> Actually, as an aside, I used to convince myself that they had a cold and needed Dimetap <laughs> around 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Anyways, <clears throat> confession time. Um, so the kids were asleep, and my wife and I had this relaxed time. Uh, I hadn't vacationed much. I wasn't a big vacationer. I was kind of what you might describe as a workaholic. And, um, and my wife asked me a question that was going to change my life. And she said, what do you think the biggest problem in the world is? And I would ask you to just think about that for a moment. And I would suggest, even though I'm not a mind reader, that there's no shortage of contenders uh, that, that we could come up with in this room uh, of ideas of what's wrong and what's the biggest problem in the world. But I thought for a moment and I said, the world is dying. And that's a profound thing to say your world is dying. And it's interesting because the, the scientific data really wasn't there, but it is in now. The amount of stuff that's alive on the earth is actually shrunk for the first time maybe. And, um, and that really began to weigh on me because I have these little kids, even though I drugged them with Dimetap <laughs> to get them to sleep, I really love them. I really care about what, what, where they're going to grow up, what it's going to look like. And, um, and so Nancy, my wife, asked me what I was going to do about it. And I really took that question seriously. And I got back to her later. It, it was months and months later um, that I got back to her and I said, I'm going to quit my job and work for free and try to fix this problem. Now she got back to me immediately and said, I don't think you need to do that. But something else had happened in my life, and that is that I had come to faith. Now, some people have a moment in time where they believe that was not the case for me. But a lot of things worked on my heart. Um, I had gone through life kind of in, in a Pollyannish mode. I didn't really see evil in the world, which is kind of surprising for an ER doctor. I started out in Washington, D.C. when it was the murder capital of the world in, in emergency medicine. Um, but I, I, I somehow, it, it didn't affect me or whatever. And then a number of things happened uh, to kind of wake me up to evil um, and, and to really bad things. My, my, my wife's brother drowned in front of her and my kids. A patient that I had had stalked me to kill me and killed his mother instead and kept her in a closet for two weeks I, while he was still looking for me. There's, there's really bad stuff out there in the world. And surprisingly, I hadn't seen it as an ER doc. And my question was, if there's evil, and if the world's dying, what is there on the other side? What, what is there to counter all this? And I began a search um, to try to make sense out of the world. And I read the Ramayana, and I read the Bhagavad Gita, and I read a lot of the Quran, but not completely. <laughs> it's pretty hard to make it through. My advice, if you're going to read, start at the back. That's where the more interesting uh, stuff occurs in the Quran. And, um, and I read um, 
I read the, uh, the, 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 the Torah, the first, the first five books of, of what we would call the Old Testament. And, and, I, and I hadn't found an answer. And um, then I read uh, the, uh, the book of Matthew one day. I, I, I p picked the book up and I read through it and, um, and everything in life changed for me. Everything changed. Um, and I, and I, would I would ask you to, to think about what it's like to become a believer with a wife who is, well, she's raised as a Jew, but my kids actually had an amalgam. They were so confused because the neighborhood we lived in were all people who kind of came from different religions and really didn't believe in much of anything. So my kids were so confused that probably by the time they were eight, they thought at Christmas time, the fiddler on the roof slid down the chimney, and if he saw a shadow, he left Easter eggs or something. <clears throat> but um, I, I began this process of learning and, and, and this walk and this journey with, with Christ. Now, and I began to think that it was the only answer, actually, to the environmental problems that we have. That only through through our faith, can we actually fix the problems that, that, that we face now? Um, one verse that really struck me was in Matthew chapter 7 of the Bible. And that's where Christ says, judge not lest you be judged. Um, with whatever manner you use to judge other people, it'll be used to judge you. He goes on to talk about that we all want to take the speck out of somebody else's eye while we have a log in our own. And that, that verse really worked on me because as it concerned the environment, I would have told you I was always a good environmentalist. Um, but, but that tells you to not measure your actions by someone else, but actually hold them up to this, this man called Christ and, and, and judge that way if you're going to do it. Because you always come out on the losing end, so to speak. Well, <clears throat> one by one, my family came to believe in what I believed in as far as religion. And we went to church, and my, my family was baptized. It was all really exciting stuff. And we got involved in a church. And um, that church did wonderful, wonderful stuff. And if you had uh, the area that we had moved to, we moved in. But the, the area we moved to uh, had a prison, and all kinds of people moved there just because Dad was in prison. But if you talked about the environment, it was almost as if you were talking about something that was heretical. How many of you have heard Christian and tree hugger in the same sentence? They don't really go together, do they? And so I wondered who was wrong. Was it the theology of the church or was it me? And, by the way, keep in mind that I had been wrong about all kinds of stuff. When I became a believer, the books I read, the art, the music I listened to, my opinions changed about a lot of things. So maybe I was wrong about this environmental stuff. And what I did was, and, and anybody can do it, do it this weekend, I sat down and I read through the Bible. And I underlined anything that had to do with God, the environment, and man. And um, what I found was that the church was wrong. That the Bible um, is a story about God relating to us through the made world. Um, I'll point out just one thing. I'll go back to that tree hugger thing. I want you to imagine that you're in your house and you're in the most comfortable seat in your house. Sofa, recliner, whatever. What's in front of it? TV, right, yeah, TV. What's in front of God's? Well, the Bible actually says what's in front of God's throne in heaven. The last page of the Bible, Revelation 22, God looks at a tree. That's what's in front of his. 
most comfortable seat, okay? And that tree, um, according to ancient Hebrew writing, is not just a regular tree, it's a big tree. Of course, it's God's tree, it's the tree of life. And it would take 500 years to climb the tree, according to their writing. And under this tree, which bears fruit all the time, we're told that in the shade of it, all the nations will finally find peace. And the Bible begins with a tree. It's the symbol of the Lord. It's the tree of life. If you open most Bibles, a majority of Bibles have a tree on one of the pages before the text begins. Um, the Life Application Study Bibles have a tree on, as the watermark on every page. Uh, the symbol of the Lord is a tree. Well, it's interesting. How many of you have had a sermon on trees? But they occur a thousand times in the Bible. It's the symbol of the Lord. And the first psalm begins by describing that a righteous person is like a tree. Christ is described as looking like a tree in, in Isaiah 53. And I think you could go through and you could look at all the things that are revealed uh, in all the transactions that take place between God and man using trees. But I think the most interesting one for the Christian is the one that takes place um, with Christ. Because um, Christ is one of the only two named carpenters in the Bible. That is not by accident. That uh, God made flesh is going to be a carpenter and work with trees. And, um, and the most important event in the, in the Christian mind or way of thinking is that, that, that Jesus is going to stretch out his calloused carpenter's hands and die on a tree. And so I, I would maintain that if you actually go through the Bible and look at it, you'll find a different story than what we've been taught in church recently. Now, it's interesting. I was given um, a Bible by somebody who was cleaning out their aunt's house after she died. And she said, oh, well, you believe in this stuff. Why don't you take this old Bible? It's a King James Bible. And I didn't even look at it for a while. Um, and uh, eventually one day I kind of opened it up and I found out it was, it was published by Thomas Nelson Publishing, still in business, King James, we're talking, you know, orthodox, and it's a study Bible. And I opened it up and I started looking through it. It's got 45 pages in it on what I talk about, God and the environment. It has four full pages devoted just to pictures of trees. The most famous tree a hundred years ago in the world was Abraham's oak, and I'd never heard of it. Nobody had ever mentioned it. It was not only the subject of sermons, it's, it's the subject of a good piece of this study Bible. Um, I wondered, have we ever gotten off so far in the church in our theology as we are perhaps today with environmental stuff? And I actually found the answer is yes. Is anybody here from a Methodist or a Wesleyan background? Go ahead, fess up. All right, there's a number of you. Nothing to be ashamed of. This is one of the heroes of the faith, as they say. Well, John Wesley um, was Anglican, and um, he, never, he never became anything but Anglican. And, um, but he arrives on the scene in England, um, and he found a problem that was similar, something that the church started ignoring the Bible. And um, he kind of couldn't believe it. Now, the most interesting thing to me is that he wrote a book about it to help fix the problem. And it was his best-selling book, and it was published for 138 continual years, and no Methodist other than outside of academia has ever heard of it. It was a medical textbook. Surprise? I mean, most people are. I, the only reason I know about it, I have a 250-year-old copy of it handed, handed down in my family. Um, well, what he found was that people wouldn't take care of sick people. If you were sick, 
that was your problem with God. <laughs> and if I came to help you, that was works, and I wasn't supposed to do works, okay? So there isn't, there isn't a, a church on the planet except for a Catholic church. Catholics would, didn't, didn't go down this road. And so Wesley wrote this textbook, and he solved the problem. You know, there's a, there's a Presbyterian hospital, there's a Methodist hospital, there's, there's probably even a Unitarian hospital somewhere. I, haven't, I, I don't know where it is. But he solved the problem so much that we don't even think about it anymore. I actually believe that when the church becomes fully engaged in environmental problems, that someday, a couple hundred years from now, this will be something that they'll talk about in some academic setting, and that's about it. Um, what, what I have found um, is, is that when, you, when, when I speak to churches, and, and is that what the human heart responds to most is not statistics. Um, are you two married? Did you marry him because the stats were right? <laughs> Nobody falls in love because the statistics are right. They might get divorced because the statistics are wrong or something, but they don't fall in love because the statistics are right. The human heart responds to stuff that you can't get a micrometer around. We respond to peace and justice and love and beauty and aesthetics and all these things that you can't measure with the tools of science. I'm not saying science isn't important. That's my background in science. But... That's not what the human heart really responds to. The one statistic I have in the book that I am, I'm really happy that's in there, there's hardly any, um, is this one. That when polled, 90% of Americans say that they're kinder than average. Do the math, okay? Um, <laughs> well, that, that kind of goes back to that judge not lest you be judged. We always think that the that, that, that we're better, perhaps, than we are. And I found that the teaching of Christ, which, by the way, you can go through the Bible in proof text. It says we're not supposed to pollute the water. We're not supposed to cut down a tree. Even if it, we're at war, if the tree is fruit-bearing, it tells you not to, not to extinct an animal, not to take the bird and its, and its fledgling or whatever. There's all kinds of proof texting about taking care of the planet. In Revelation, it says, I will come back in Revelation 11 and destroy the destroyers of the earth. I promise you, you don't want to be in that category, biblically speaking. But I think that the, the, that the parable that Christ tells that has the most um, bearing on, on the situation today is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I'll tell you why. Um, the parable of the Good Samaritan is the most known parable in the world. It's known outside of the Christian world even. But I'm going to tell it to you, and maybe you'll, you'll, you'll see it perhaps in a little bit different light. Christ is having this discussion with an attorney um, in, in the book of Luke about how you get to heaven. Now, for most people, that's, that's a question we ponder. How do we get to heaven? What do I have to do to get to heaven? And what comes up is that you have to love the Lord with all your heart and mind and strength and soul and your neighbors yourself. How do you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul? Well, maybe with your heart, maybe but with your strength. How do you love the Lord? You should really ponder this, I think. And C.S. Lewis says it, it, it's, a little, it's a little more than uh, how can you do anything for the Lord? And he puts it this way. He says it's like, a, it's like a boy coming to dad at Christmas time and saying, Dad, can I have $20 to buy you a tie? No one can suppose that dad comes out ahead on the deal, right? There's not much that you can do for the Lord. And yet, for those of you who are parents, who've ever had a kid do something like that, you know that it pleases the parent. Um, one of the ways that we can love the Lord with our strength and heart and mind and soul is by doing that to our neighbor. By loving our neighbor and by acting out our love of God through how we treat our neighbor. That's one of the ways Christ is saying here. And he's questioned by, by this uh, religious scholar, well, who is my neighbor? 
The question might be, is your neighbor, or should you really concern yourself with somebody um, who perhaps uh, lives on the other side of the world? With somebody who isn't going to be born for 50 years? You take it to whatever extent you want. That's what Christ is working on here. And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. This is a story. There's a Jew going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's traveling east. And it says that he's going down. And that's because there's over a 2,000-foot elevation drop between Jerusalem and Jericho. Jerusalem's the city on the hill. And I believe it's about 17 miles. So it's a long journey. It's longer than I'd want to walk in a day. Um, and he falls among thieves. And they take everything from him. They take all of his clothes, his shoes, his backpack, his iPod, his cell phone, the works. And he's left on the side of the road, naked and moaning. And Christ has just closed a couple of loopholes here to this very sharp scholar who's trying to question him, catch him out. We know he's alive. He's moaning. If for some reason I could convince myself in that day and age that the person were dead, or then, then by Levitical law, maybe I shouldn't touch him. Um, and uh, so along comes somebody from his own church, his faith, probably, probably from Jerusalem. And um, in that person just passes by, doesn't do anything. And along comes another person from his faith, his, his hometown, his, his church. It's good luck for him, right? He's going to get a second chance. And the person passes by. And I believe that what Christ is doing here is telling you these two people did something different. He Jesus is always using this Aramaic storytelling technique of ramping up the response. You get ten talents, five talents, one talent. You, you send you know, a servant, you send the son, then the master comes. Look at Christ tell stories. This is a common technique. And so the second person does something slightly different here. And um, what he does, I believe, is cross the road. And it's worded differently. He crosses the road. And I believe this is where most of us live um, when it comes to problems and reaching out. Um, we're the second person. You know, the first person just walks by and they don't see anything. And the second person crosses the road. And he looks on this person. And there's some involvement. And he probably says, wow, this is terrible. This is too bad what's going on. I've got to get back to Jerusalem. Maybe I'll raise awareness. Maybe we could do a documentary on this. Maybe I could, I could go to the Roman uh, centurion and, and ask him to patrol the road here or whatever. But it really doesn't do anything for the person who needs the help. And then along comes a Samaritan. And, and, and Christ has... has by the way, Christ is accused of being a Samaritan. Um, where do you get your power? Are you a devil? Or are you a Samaritan? This is not something that um, this, this, this person on the ground would have normally looked to for help. Um, it would, the closest um, I could come up with would be, um, would be Jews and Palestinians in the West Bank, maybe. Um, there's a lot of animosity between these two groups. But along comes the Samaritan on a donkey. It's a key point. What, what is Christ telling you when he brings this guy along on a donkey? He's got money. You got to go 17 miles, bad territory, steep grade, muggers. You walk or you ride. This person has money. And, um, and now Christ is going to tell you how to get to heaven. This is a really key point. Um, the Samaritan comes along. And his heart is moved to compassion. Okay, step one. Well, second guy probably had his heart moved to compassion too. 
And then he, he, gets, he gets off and he begins to expend his resources. Has anybody ever wondered where are the muggers, by the way? I think they're still in business. And so he's not only got to see this, his heart's got to be moved, he's got to begin to expend his resources, um, but it's dangerous. It's going to involve some danger. And he uses his wine and his oil and his bandages, and he starts taking care of this guy. And now it's going to get inconvenient. He's going to have to use his strength. He puts the person up on his donkey, and he takes him to the equivalent of a hospital where um, he pays the bill. And he, he not only pays the bill, but he says, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up the tab ongoing because I don't know how much it's going to end up being. Is there anybody here that's a doctor or a nurse? You ever seen, where, where do you work? In the, nurse practitioner? Have you ever heard of strangers coming in and paying the bill for somebody? <laughs> well, I saw about 30,000 patients as a doc. And one time, somebody came in and paid the bill for a stranger. Um, it's not a common thing. And, this, and so this person pays the bill, and he's not going to get thanked. In other words, if you do something for the future, they're not going to be able to thank you. Um, but I think, for me, the, the, the take-home message is that the first thing that we have to do if we're going to get involved in this problem, environmental or whatever, is how many kids have we got here? Okay, you've got to get off your donkey. I'll put it that way, okay? That's the first thing Christ is telling you. There's little kids in the room. I'd put it a different way if they weren't. Um, let's talk. You get the first question. When you're talking to church people, yeah. what's the biggest obstacle that consciousness or in their conversation with you when you're getting the message behind you? Okay. The, the question is, when I talk to church people, what's the biggest obstacle, objection, perhaps, or whatever to what I'm saying? Well, I, um, I am happy that I have not really known any barriers in where I get to go and talk. I get to talk to extremely conservative churches and schools um, and, uh, who, who, where I am frequently the first person through the door to give the message. Um, and, um, and I talk to uh, places that, you know, have got a green sanctuary and solar panels on the roof. So I, I get to do the whole span. More and more, I'm in the very conservative churches. Um, and uh, some of its theology is, is this really something that's in the Bible? How, why haven't we had a sermon on it? Um, uh, and, and some of it's the objection of, well, it's all going to go up anyways, so why bother? And, um, you know, it's all going to get taken up in the rapture, toasted earth, new earth. And so, so I'll work in addressing those kind of things. But often it's just complacency. And that's for everybody. It doesn't matter what their politics or their religion is. It's just complacency. Um, and I think there's also, um, it, uh, the, the, the flip side is that there's this tremendous uh, energy and uh, this journey that you can go on when you get involved in, in, in this type of work. Environmentalism is kind of the only activity that we can carry out where we worship God all the time. And we're not going to get thanked for it. In other words, if you live that mindful life and you get into your shower, how are you going, how are you going to praise God in the shower, right? Well, you can sing or you can take a shorter shower, which saves a chunk of mountain or something because you haven't had to burn as much coal. No one's going to thank you for it or whatever. But the more of these things you do, you begin to grow as a spiritual human being. Um, and so that's the flip side is, is the promise of growing as a spiritual human being. Yes?
Well, the, and the question is, um, if you have a church and they've got to spend extra money to do something that's environmentally sound, how do you rationalize that when they're starving people? Let's just get it down to that. Well, often they're in a church like this. Somebody's rationalized big buildings <laughs> somehow, right? Um, but um, one of the things I, I tell everybody to do is, is, you know, churches are made up of individuals. And if, if you begin to live a, a, a little more simply um, and a, a little bit more humbly or meekly, as Christ would put it, um, you're going to free up resources yourself. And um, if, if, um, if you go home and you change all the light bulbs in your house, I, I know because a guy did this, and he changed all the light bulbs in his house to compact fluorescence, he had $100 more each month after that. You just freed up the resources or whatever. Um, you skip a meal at a restaurant, you just freed up the resources. For the resistant church that won't, you know, won't you know, go with the $1,200, go buy them for them. Get a couple of people together. The Bible says heap coals on somebody's head when they're doing what you don't quite think is right. In other words, make their face turn red with embarrassment that you out-loved them, out-gave them, out, out, um, out-loved them. And so, you know, that for most churches, it's, it's not a matter of this or that. What they find is the more you give, the more you got to give. And um, there's a, a church in Lexington, Kentucky, that um, is, is kind of really going with this. They're not a huge church. They've got about 3,000. In Lexington, that doesn't make you a mega church or anything. But they decided that at Christmas time, who needs another Christmas gift? What adult needs another Christmas gift? And so they collected $170,000 just to drill wells for people in Afghanistan. Guess what? They have more members. People are giving more. Once you start giving, it, it becomes uh, a wonderful habit, I think. Most of the time in the church, we're giving to ourselves. We're building a bigger building. I'm not saying that buildings are bad, but we're worrying about ourselves often before we are our neighbor. It's a good question. It's a very thoughtful and pensive crowd. Are you eating after the talk, or did you eat before? <laughs> yes. Hi. Diane. I went to medical school with Diane, and I haven't seen her in a quarter of a century. How are you doing? Do we get the hug? Yeah. We haven't seen each other in 20 years. Yeah. So Matt used to run in a circle that um, used to tell us when we were feeling bad about studying that he was going to die. Oh, thanks. You haven't aged at all. I lost my hair. You still have yours. Okay. Um, well, you know, it's interesting because I think we don't need more stuff. We just need to be more thankful for what we have. And I'll tell you a true story. Um, okay. Most of us are comfortable saying a prayer before we eat of thanks at Thanksgiving at least, okay? Can I, can I guess that everybody here probably said a prayer at Thanksgiving, even if you don't do it every meal? Why did you do that? Because 
because you got a, a lot of food, because it's God's sustaining hand in your life, because other people don't have enough, and because you're not entitled to it. It's a gift from the Lord. That's why we say thanks at Thanksgiving, or every meal, if that's what you say. And my question uh, what, uh, you know, that I kind of put to myself was, and I'll put it to you, how many of you say a prayer of thanks when you fill your car up with gas? Well, in, 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 in the question I posed to myself is, why wasn't I saying a prayer of thanks when I filled the car up with gas? Is it because I felt entitled to it? Is it because I thought everybody had as much as they wanted? Is it because I didn't think it was God's sustaining hand in my life or, life, or was it necessary to my lifestyle? Um, so in fact, um, I, changed, I changed what I was doing. I don't know, every time, but I say prayers of thanks when I, when I put gas in the car. So I was in this church in Beaumont, Texas, and I said this in a church, and, um, and then this um, pastor drove us back to Houston, and, and um, they stopped, and I jumped out, and I filled the tank up with gas, okay? And then I went into the gas station slash convenience store to pay for it. And the woman behind the counter said, you already paid for it. You don't need to. And I said, no, I didn't pay for it. I didn't put a credit card in there. Um, yes, you did. The computer says you paid for it. Did not, did to, did not, did to. <laughs> and then finally she gets a little peeved with me and she says, listen, mister, can't you just accept it as a miracle? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm not promising you a free tank of gas if you, if you give a thanks when you fill your gas tank up. But, but rearranging your heart in thankfulness is a, is a good thing to do. There's more to this story. I told this story somewhere else. In Tennessee, as a matter of fact, in Knoxville. And somebody liked this story. Anyways, they sent me a card that you can get $100 worth of gas on. So I said, I'm going to keep telling that story. I can't find it, but I didn't even know there were cards you could send to people to get $100 worth of gas. Uh, I think it's not a shortage of resources. It's, it's, a shortage, it's a shortage of thankfulness. And um, it's just like I don't think there's a shortage of wonderment or wonders on the planet. It's just we, we, it's a shortage of wonderment um, that, that we, we've taken, um, uh, we've become too mechanistic. You had a question. Clicks the switch up and down goes the mountain. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure what the link is. I think that's the promise of faith. Now, by the way, I, I really like Jeff Barry's film, and I like Jeff Barry, and I'm meeting him for breakfast two days from now. I, I really like Jeff, and I think that his film has been very, very successful. I think what makes it successful, and I think he actually has measured what results he gets from that, and he gets results, is that it's a story of his change. Your message has to be powerful enough to change you. And Jeff really lives that out, and I try to live it out. My, my electric bill skyrocketed last month. I'm embarrassed. It went up to $25. It's usually 15 but we had about six people living with us and it's the darkest month of the year or whatever. Um, but if, it, if I don't live this out, it's not really a very powerful message. Um, and um, when, when I quit my job, we, we moved, and we, we moved into a house the size of our garage. 
and we cut our electric bill to a tenth of what it is, and we cut our fossil fuel use to a third, and we cut our, our trash to about a tenth, don't feel sorry for me. Have you ever seen a doctor's garage? I mean, this is not, you know, there isn't anyone, in, I, I've been able to do a little medicine on the border of Nicaragua and Honduras. There's no one that I ever took care of there that wouldn't take the shed I have outside for the garden tools as their home. You know, we just have so much. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I think that's the promise of faith, though, is that in, in a faith community, we, we actually demand accountability of each other. You know, you can't have a pastor get up and talk about, you know, um, you know being a good parent and, and, and have them caught out beating their kids lots <laughs> and, and get away with it for long. There's an accountability. And, and I think that's, that's the, um, one of the promise of large faith groups uh, doing this. Um, uh, Corey over here is filming me, and has anybody ever seen a NUMA film? Rob Bell, all that? Okay, this is, this is, this is one of the guys here that, that does those. And, and we're, we're, we're going to do a series of films on, on the screen stuff that will be, be like those. Um, but it's interesting, I was up at um, preaching at, at Rob Bell's church, and they got 10,000 people. And, and Rob's changed his house. He's gotten a different car. He's living in a section of town now where you don't even have to pay taxes. When I went and stayed with him, my car got hit. Nobody left a note on it. You know, that, that kind of neighborhood. And, um, but there's change. There's real change. And then the church got together, and they built um, a lead certified triplex, and they gave it away. Okay, so I'm, now I'm on the East Coast, and I'm talking to a pastor, and... and you know, these pastors want to check you out before they let you in front of their 10 or 12 or 15,000 people. And this is one of those kind of churches. And I'm talking to the pastor, and, and I said, well, you know, they did a series of a month's worth of teachings there, and then they, they built that triplex and everything. Later on in the meal, he says, you know, there is no reason that we can't do six weeks of this. And why should we stop at three townhouses and give them away, you know? There's a, a, even a nice little kind of competition that can happen. Um, to kind of wake the church up. And I think that's what the faith group is. But exactly how, how much awareness transfers, I don't, I don't think we have enough power just from awareness. I think that we need God to help us do these dramatic changes. You know, if I was to try to convince somebody that the Bible is real, it's not about how many days the earth was made in or whether dinosaurs had eyes or, or whatever. That's, it, that's not the power of the Bible. It's not about the age of rocks. It's about the rock of ages. It's about change. It's about redemption. And, and it can change lives. And it, and it can solve huge problems. If I wanted to convince somebody that the Bible is real, I'd bring in 20 people who've gotten off drugs because they believed. Um, and you would have a hard time matching them with 20 people who got off drugs because their awareness was raised about it. You know what I mean? So I think there's a real power in, in that Christ has to offer us. Yes, sir. You mentioned in your presentation that your family followed the footsteps uh, in faith after you did. Um, and I'm assuming afterwards they also followed your, uh, you know, your, convic your convictions about uh, environmentalism and you know, downsizing or things like that. Uh, how about, like, how did they adjust to it like you did, I guess? Okay. And, the like your wife and your two kids. The question is, um, my family followed me in faith, and they followed me on this environmental journey. And um, how did they adjust to it? Well, the easy answer is that, you know, once my wife and I became evangelical Christians, if our kids didn't go along with us, we just beat them. But that's not, you know, that's, that's the silly answer. Um, <laughs> a couple of doctor's kids, uh, kind of spoiled. Um, I loved my kids 10 years ago, but I didn't like them at all. And that's really hard to say. And it's hard for them to hear. They've heard that, you know, when I'm in a church or something. I love them and I like them now. We, we started on this journey and it was hard. It wasn't always easy. You know, to go from um, a maid that came in three times a week 
to you got to clean, you got to do the dishes, and after you're through with the dishes, washing the dishes, you need to go hang the clothes on the line. There was a little bit of kicking. Um, it's interesting that we, one of the first things that I would say that, that, that we did was to get rid of the TV. And uh, there's a lot of pressure in the world to conform, to, to watch TV and play the, you know, on sports and that sort of thing. And um, a teacher of my son started videotaping a show and bringing it in and telling me he could go watch it because she was afraid that he would turn out to be stupid if he didn't have access to the television. It's a true story, okay? Um, I'm just gonna brag for a second, okay? Because I'm a dad, you're allowed to. My son is gonna graduate from college this year. He's 19 and he's going to med school. My daughter um, is 17 and she's a sophomore in college. When she took the SATs as a 15-year-old, she, she missed two questions and she disputes one, okay? <laughs> the, and they're, you know, they're just kids. But the point is, actually, when you opened up this spiritual landscape, you also open up the mental landscape for young people. And um, they didn't turn out dumb. Uh, now, it was hard, and, but we went on the spiritual journey together, and we know why we're a family. You know, there's so many, you know, uh, there's so many, those plaques, you know, the Jeremiah, as for me and my family, we serve the Lord. But that's what makes a family, you know. Uh, it isn't focusing on the family. It's focusing on the Lord and what the Lord wants you to do. I think that really makes the family. Yes. Yeah, the question is, do I speak to medical groups because medicine focuses on cure and not prevention? And if you think about it, if, you got, if you've got um, breast cancer in one in seven women, if one in seven people is getting a deadly disease, running for the cure is about as dumb a thing as you can do. It's time to start looking for the cause and preventing it. And, and you're right, we're not very good at focusing on um, prevention. Um, I've, I've done a couple of grand rounds. I've got to tell you that the silent group here, the, 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 the group that I think is inexcusably uh, asleep on this issue are the, the physicians in the United States. I have no excuse for them. Um, we, we've got the training, we've got the statistics, we know something is wrong, we, we know that it, the cost of doing medicine goes up every single year, and that the, um, the lifespan is actually backing down, that means we're not winning. <laughs> we're not even getting ahead, and we don't ask why. Um, uh, so, um, I would hope to speak to more of those groups, um, but, it, but it hasn't been a big emphasis of mine. Um, yes? Well, we're more and more in, you know, yeah, we're more and more an indoor um, uh, society or whatever. One of, the, one of the questions that we can maybe, who here is, I'm going to put everybody on the spot, who here is under 25? Raise your hand. Okay. And keep your hands up. Raise your other hand if you have never seen the Milky Way. Don't feel embarrassed about this because, yeah, all of you. Has anybody here seen the Milky Way who's under 25? Uh, not with a telescope. 
just a few of you, almost no one under 25 has seen the Milky Way. Is that important? God takes Abraham by the shoulders and says, look at my best view in the galaxy. It is the galaxy here. and shows it to him. It's in, and older folks don't realize that, 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 this, um, that, that this beauty hasn't been revealed. And, and so I think it's really important to take people outside. And there's that book, Last Child in the Woods and, and everything. How can you value something you've never seen? Um, and, and it's not their fault. It just hasn't been shown to them. Yeah, and, and air pollution and that, and that sort of thing. Um, this issue, I believe, has this great power, by the way, to bring people together. And am I out of time, by the way, Gay? No, I'm just, okay. True story. In uh, October, I think it was, of last year, um, a rabbi called me up, and um, it was in an academic city just like this, and, um, and he said, will you please come and tell my congregation what evangelical Christians think about the environment? So there's a bad statistical pick here. But anyways, I said, oh, I'd be delighted. And it just so happened that it was Sukkot, which on the Hebrew calendar is kind of a harvest festival. It's a, it's a light, it's a minor holiday, but it's really nice, and you build a Sukkot house, and you, you have you, um, a meal in it and everything. And so I went to this synagogue, largest synagogue north of Boston, uh, at Sukkot. But it's an academic community. He teaches in the religion department. He got to talking, and the, um, the head of Islamic studies said, you know, we would like to know what the evangelical Christian has to say about the environment as well. And it's Ramadan. And Muslims can break fast in a synagogue. It's okay. So why don't we come and hear what the evangelical Christian has to say about the environment? Well, then, then the chaplain said, oh, it's the Feast of St. Francis. Why don't the Christians come? This is like the dawning of the age of Aquarius or something here, okay? So they all come in this huge room, and they began the way you should begin any difficult discussion, breaking bread together. But it just so happened that like three days before, Israel bombed Lebanon. Now, how many of you have been asked to go to talk to a group of Jews, Muslims, and Christians before, when one of them was like firing on the other? I was nervous. And um, so I wanted to bone up on Abraham, because Abraham is who we all have in common. And I read the story of Abraham with new eyes. And, and I, it's like, there's new stuff happening in the Middle East. His, his nephew gets kidnapped in a war and he has to go bail him out. That's still going on. Um, people get stuck in tar pits. Oil shows up in the Middle East for the first time as, as something. You know, on and on. But so I, 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 I come and when, when we finish eating, everybody's in, in this in this large auditorium, and I said, out of respect to everybody here who has Abraham as their common root, I'm going to limit my remarks to just same-sex marriage, abortion, and politics in the Middle East. Well, they got the joke. They laughed in a, in a couple of seconds. There was some silence, but they all started laughing. And the point being that we all live on this planet together, and unless we kind of do some stuff fast, um, those other things will be minor. There won't be anything to, to, to argue about. The Bible says that the Lord makes the, the rain to fall on the wicked and the just. And unfortunately, the acid rain does the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes. Yeah.
right? Right, how, how do I deal with that? Well, I ask people to think, well, now what is the religion on the planet that actually worships trees? I mean, which, which religion brings a tree into their house every year for weeks and puts decorations on it and sings songs to it and puts little statues of their God underneath it? Which religion is that? The point is, they're not worshiping the trees. It's a very clear, clear dividing line, I think. So I think that's just an excuse. Um, in, in, in fact, the, you know, the Bible says that if I go and I stand in a group of trees, you know, and they clap their hands to the Lord, then I'm actually, I'm stepping into a worship service. Those trees have no separation between themselves and, and God. Um, and... Um, and if, if you look at the hymns in, out of Christendom, and if you start with St. Francis's, all, all creatures of our God and King, and you come through, this is my Father's world, and for the beauty of the earth. You know, there's lines in there like, in the whispering grass, I hear him pass. Um, I, I just think we've gotten so busy, we don't understand that God is paying quite a bit of attention to those trees and, and birds, and um, in the, in that we ought to reacquaint ourselves with the Bible. Why does God have a tree in front of him in heaven if it's not important? Um, and so I think we've just gotten away from the theology. You know, I get questions like, are there, are there animals in heaven? Yes, it says so in the Psalms. Just go read the Bible. Um, so it's interesting from a scientific point of view is that throughout most of history, we didn't know what it was about the air that made us live. Um, oxygen is only discovered a couple hundred years ago by a minister in France. And, um, and where does it come from? The tree of life turns out to be aptly named on all kinds of levels. Without it, we don't exist. Um, so that's how I would answer it. Yes? Oh, sure. Can I, can I share some specifics? I've gotten that question so many times that I have another book coming out that's just all the nuts and bolts um, kind of things, because a lot of church have, churches have moved to, okay, how do we do the nuts and bolts? Um, and there's, there, you know that term silos? We live in silos. I, I tell you, a lot of the churches, I was in, in Manhattan in the 60 Minutes office talking to them for 90 minutes about whether to give me five minutes of fame, okay? And the producer says, I don't understand why your people don't know <laughs> about this environmental issue. And um, I had like three handlers with me, you know, guy, three guys that went along to make sure I didn't have teeth on my, uh, spinach on my teeth, okay? And one of them is Jim Jewell, who was Chuck Colson's chief of staff for 17 years or something like that. And Jim says, well, you know, and, and she said, because our 60 minutes reaches 20 million people a day or, or a, a week or something like that. And Jim said, well, it's probably because a lot of the people he's talking to get their news from SRN, who reaches 25 million people a day. And, and the producer went, what is SRN? <laughs> In other words, there's some real silos here that need to be <laughs> broken down, you know. Um, and, and so some of the specifics. Um, uh, Salem Radio Network. It's, it's an extremely large news. It would be like Moody or whatever. And, and I'm on Moody all the time, and I write in Christianity Today, and I'm on SRN's kind of stuff. So I don't necessarily work over on the NPR side. I, I do, but not all the time, because there's you know, a church group that I want to reach. Um, but the specifics, um, I think the first thing you have to do, it's just like going on a diet. You've got to know what you weigh. Um, uh, I'm, Diane, I'm going to put you on the spot. You know, did, did you, no, did you, no, did you, did you, as a doctor, did you ever encounter that person who was plump, very round, who said, I only eat toast and tea? There's so many doctors that encountered this that somebody actually did a study on it. Do these people subsist only on, t you know, toast and tea and continue to weigh 500 pounds. Is that possible? Turns out it's not possible, 
you know, their toast and tea consisted of pizza and subs and that sort of thing. Um, I think you have to know how much you weigh if you're going to kind of go on an energy diet. And so if, if, you, um, if you spend $100 a month on energy, go to 90. You don't have to solve it all, you know, in a moment, but start a journey. Know how much it is that you use, whether that's dollars or kilowatt hours or whatever. There's this thing, there's the bookstore here is selling books, and there's a, there's a footprinting thing in the back. Um, and those are hardbacks. They're kind of expensive. You can, get, you can get paperbacks really cheap from Amazon or whatever if you want. Or you can get the thing for free off the internet um, of the... Uh, of, of how to uh, footprint, change all the light bulbs. If every family in the United States changed just their five most used bulbs to compact fluorescence, you could take 21 coal plants offline tomorrow, be the same as taking 8 million cars off the road, a trillion fewer pounds of gases in the air. Change the bulbs. Question I always get, what about the mercury in the bulbs? Anybody heard that? Yeah, I'll just answer it here. There's four milligrams of mercury in a compact fluorescent bulb on average. Um, and um, I was talking to Scott Fulton, who's the EPA judge who made the ruling on this, and he said, Matthew, if you took every one of those bulbs out and threw it in the waterway, we'd be out ahead because they save two and a half times that amount of mercury from being put in the air. Seventy percent of our energy in the United States comes from coal. That's the largest stream of mercury in our environment. If you, if you could take a pond and take all the mercury out of it, tomorrow there would be mercury in it from the fallout from coal dust, okay? But you know there's a line in the Bible called straining at the gnat and swallowing the camel? Now let's get into perspective. A rotary thermostat has 4,000 milligrams of mercury in it. I think it's a red herring. Change the bulbs. Um, the other, and, and there's all kinds of practical stuff, and there's a, there's a website, servegodsavetheplanet.org. Just go in there, and it has a lot of the practical stuff. I'm, I'm going to have a book out. Am I out of time? I need to sign books for 10 minutes? Oh, okay. But I will tell you what I think is the most important habit that you need to get into. And I used to say it was change the bulbs or hang your clothes on the line. I don't own a clothes dryer. I haven't owned one for, I don't know, seven years or something like that. Um, it's keep the Sabbath. That, that is the single biggest habit, I think. Begin to grow a religious life. Uh, uh, the, it's interesting. The commandments begin, thou shall not or do not or all that. The fourth commandment begins, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And, um, uh, and it says, let everything come to rest. Your maidservant, your manservant. Who are our maidservants and our manservants? They're the people that work at Walmart. They're the people who have no choice about working on Sundays. The stranger in your land, that's the illegal immigrant. It's very specific. And let the animals come to rest. Um, and a lot of keeping the Sabbath has been about defining work as opposed to focusing on Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's a holy day. Um, and I think it's the single best exercise. There's a lot of books out about the Sabbath. Norman Wurtzbar, there's a Rabbi Herschel who has a great book. Um, and now the true story and the last story. I've lost my Sabbath. I had a Sabbath day for years, and I've lost it because I go continually, and I'm trying to get it back. Um, and, and I realized this summer, I'm, I'm sitting at my desk working, and I got a letter from a guy named Eugene Peterson. For those of you who don't know, he wrote a book called The Message, okay? And he said, man, I'm praying for you, and I'm proud, and I saw that article you did there, and all this kind of stuff. He said, but are you keeping the Sabbath? Busted. And, um, <laughs> and later that day, uh, a pastor from Vermont called me. He said, you came here, and you talked about the Sabbath, and I started keeping it not as just a day off. I'd always done that but it's a holy day, a day spent in the woods, a day spent in joy with my grandchildren and everything. He says, changed my whole life. My depression, lifelong depression has lifted. I really want to thank you for setting the example on this. Double busted. So I am really working to keep my Sabbath and to get it back. It's difficult uh, for me, but learn from my mistake. 
um, uh, keep a Sabbath. That's the most important practical thing that you can do. Incidentally, if we all came to a stop one day out of the week, we'd use 14% less energy. <laughs> okay, I think, I think I'm done. Am I allowed to close in prayer? Sure. Okay, well, sometimes I'm in, you know, I talk to the Sierra Club. Not everybody believes in, and so this is the way I always put it. I want you to, if you believe in prayer, um, then I want you to, to stand up and we'll pray this. And if you don't believe in prayer, if you think people who do are foolish, I understand where you're coming from. Please stand up and pray for your friend who does believe in prayer, okay? So let's, let's stand up. And I'll just, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm just going to use the most famous environmentalist, the patron saint of the environment's prayer. It's St. Francis. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.